It was an icy day before Christmas 2017. Despite the cold weather in Bucharest, hundreds of thousands of people gathered together to mourn the death of King Michael of Romania. Prince Charles of Wales, as well as King Juan Carlos of Spain, attended the funeral of one of the last Eastern Orthodox monarchs in the world. Many revered him as a dignified statesman who witnessed the destruction of old Europe under Hitler and Stalin, the tumultuous unfolding of the Cold War, as well as the post-1989 rebirth of democratic institutions in his native region. Though relatively unknown to the broader public in the West, King Michael's life was nothing short of extraordinary. In 1927, his father left the throne to pursue a romantic adventure with a larger-than-life mistress, Elena Lupescu. She was born in 1895, she died in 1977. The royal families in Europe sanctioned this betrayal of the marriage vows, which the astute and yet amoral prince, Carol II, had spoken before the youthful Princess Helen of Greece and Denmark. She was also the prince who saved many, many Jews in the Second World War. Those were the days when ordinary people saw the open practice of adultery as unacceptable for a sovereign exercising the highest office in the country. As a consequence, Carl II resigned and Michael, the young Michael, was made king of Romania at the age of six. While still very young, he saw his mother exiled to Italy after his father made a shameless return to power through a coup d'etat. Her mother lived in Florence from that time on. Tormented by self-doubt and shocked by the sexual profligacy of King Carl II, the young Michael grew up as a silent, shy and earnest teenager. His mother, Helen, introduced him to the spiritual riches of Eastern Orthodoxy. This attachment to Christianity grew stronger after he took some private classes with the maverick historian of Byzantium, Professor Nikolae Yorga who lived close to us here in Bucharest. Later, Michael acquired a taste for the military uniform while developing a real passion for planes and American cars. He was fond of Jeep cars, for instance. Sandwiched between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Empire, interwar Romania tried very hard to maintain its traditional democratic allegiance towards Great Britain and the United States of America. In the early 1930s, however, Europe witnessed the rise of tribal nationalism led by populist parties dissatisfied with parliamentary rule. Influential thinkers such as Carl Schmitt theorized the importance of political voluntarism, by which he meant the promotion of an all-knowing leader who had a direct connection to the soul of the nation, as he put it. To his surprise, Michael discovered that many public intellectuals such as Nionescu, as well as ordinary people such as the peasants, invested great emotional capital in the false promises of various political messiahs, bigoted demagogues and rabid anti-Semites such as Cornelio Codranu were able to win many votes by promising swift delivery from the corrupt affairs of the political establishment. On September 6, 1940, the fascist organization called Iron Guard became the ruling party in Romania under the strict command of General Ion Antonescu. It was in this context that King Michael and the Queen Mother Helen did their best to save as many Jewish lives as possible, from Transnistria in, in particular, by asking the German ambassador Manfred von Killinger to stop all deportations to the current Republic of Moldova. Because of their intervention, medical aid, food, clothing were all made available to those put in the concentration camps. This is why Yad Vashem Museum in Jerusalem recognized King Michael's mother as a righteous among the nations, stating that she, I quote, saved the lives of thousands of Jews, including orphans sentenced to death by the SS officer Adolf Eichmann. In ways similar to Greece, Italy or Portugal, Romania was an agrarian society. To understand the traditional peasants' attitude towards history, 
we should perhaps digress by explaining the gist of a compelling myth widely disseminated in the Balkans folklore. Once upon a time, a young shepherd lived near a low foothill at heaven's door sill. The main character owned horses of a rare breed and fierce hounds protecting his flock, but not necessarily himself. The shepherd was wealthier than his comrades. Envy kicked in and the ruthless competitors plotted to kill the gifted one. Instead of putting up any form of resistance, the shepherd decided to recast the experience of death in terms of marriage with his own destiny. Is this stoic appropriation of Amor Fati? We don't know, really. But the Romanian shepherd believed that his physical annihilation did not bring an end to life, but instead introduced a new otherworldly dimension in which his soul and the stars could celebrate a cosmic wedding. This Gandhi-like approach to non-violent behavior has often translated into a sense of collective resignation, melancholy and powerlessness, especially among the ordinary people. To some extent, the story of the lonely shepherd is an allegory of King Michael's minimal use of power as the sovereign of a Christian nation. Confronted with the German economic takeover of its natural resources, as well as with the Soviet invasion of its historical territory of Moldova, the province of Stephen the Great by the mid-15th century, Romania accepted its unhappy fate. From 1941 to 1944, King Michael was forced to swallow Adolf Hitler's alliance with the fascist dictator General Antonescu, while from 1944 to 1947, the same King Michael consented to the ruthless Bolshevik appropriation of a defenseless country. Bullied by the Soviets and abandoned by his Western allies, King Michael wasn't able to save the rule of law or any democratic institution. Despite all the humiliations inflicted by Stalin's wartime diplomat, Andrei Vyshinsky, what King Michael managed to rescue was the symbol of the crown, equated with the notions of honor and dignity. On January 3, 1948, he left Romania and settled in Switzerland. There, he reinvented himself as a loyal husband to Queen Anna and father of five daughters, for whom he raised chickens on a domestic farm. King Michael's painful exile was accompanied by the disappearance of all previous forms of public recognition. While still in his prime years, King Michael accepted a very humble life, being deprived of any social gratification. We may assume that Christ's self-emptying life, so powerfully described by St. Paul as kenosis, help the former monarch understand that the ultimate prestige of a true king is to care for others without being noticed, praised or rewarded for the work done in the cause of selfless love. King Michael was a Romanian shepherd fighting the totalitarian wolves of the 20th century. I'm Mihai Namsu and I'm asking you to subscribe to this channel if you like this video. Also, do not forget to support our work through your donation right now on www.patreon.com slash n-e-a-m-t-u. Thank you.